Hey Thirsty Souls, we're back in New York City. And we are preparing for our very first um, Thirsty Souls Quench event. I decided on Quench event because, I mean, it should be pretty obvious. We're quenching our Thirsty Souls. I'm scared as hell. I have been um, nervous for the past like five days. I Food literally won't go down my throat. <laughs> I can't eat. I can't eat. I, I slept three hours last night. You guys know how it is before I public speak. And anyways, my dad's really doing all the speaking. But um, I know what I, I wanted to share with you guys because I kind of felt bad. We were, uh, it's, a, it's a quench event for ages 20 to 30. And everyone's like, why is it so exclusive? And there are reasons, but I do want to share with you guys my uh, introduction to my father. He's like this reservoir of strength and morality and love and care and softness and strength, like I said before, and, um, and clarity. And he, he's, um, I'm not sure a young girl or a young woman has ever looked up to her father the way that I look up to mine. So I want to share him with as many young women and men that I can, because I know he shares himself with the world, but there are lots of young people who are not, you know, suffering, um, some are suffering, many are suffering, but there are so many people who just need basic clarity, you know, they don't know, they don't have anyone to go to, and so many people are reaching out to me and saying, I want to speak to your father, so I said, the first Quench event is going to be me introducing my father, who is the hero of my life, uh, I think he's truly, I'm not, it's a, it's a known thing, that I'm not only a Hasida, a loyal follower and student of the Lubavitch Rebbe, I am a Hasida of Harav Shmuel, Hagaon, Hakadosh, Hagadol, <laughs> my father, Rabbi Shmuley. I am, I am his most loyal and loving student. So I can't wait to share him with twenty and thirty year olds tonight. I'm just really scared. The thing is, like, I'm not actually scared. It's just like the physical symptoms of my stomach, like hurting and not being able to eat. They won't go away. But anyways, I know that it's going to be amazing, and I'll tell you why. Because I know today is Yom Hashoah, and I didn't talk about it because I just can't talk about it. It's um, whatever. It's a long story. It's too painful to talk about at this moment right now. It's like the one thing in my life that really can push me to the edge of questioning whether God exists or not. And I just don't like going there. I've gone there many times and I don't like going there when I don't need to. So um, I've done my own you know, commemoration of the six million, but I'm not gonna talk about it on the Thirsty Souls, unfortunately. Um, but there are a lot of other people talking about it. Tonight, the 28th of the 20 is Chafchas Nisan, which is the 28th of Nisan, is a day that Lubavitchers will never forget, that will live in infamy and will forever reverberate in the recesses, the subterranean depths of our hearts and our souls and our minds. Um, I wasn't even there, I wasn't born yet, and still those words quake within me uh, every, every moment of my life. I'm aware of them all the time. And um, it was a Thursday night in the year 1991, and the Lubavitch Rebbe came to 770 like he always did. I believe it was a Thursday night. Um, and he started giving over a sicha, which you guys already know. We talk about this all the time. A sicha is basically just a, a, a Torah talk. The rabbi gives over Torah and Hasidus, and he mixes in Midrashim and, and Agada and, and, uh, and the Talmud, Gemara. He mixes the Mishnah, everything. And all of a sudden, he stopped, and he... You know, we rely so much on the Lubavitch Rebbe for light, for happiness, for guidance, for clarity, for hope. When, we, when we're in despair, and this happened to my father, he came from an extremely dysfunctional family um, when he was younger, extremely dysfunctional, and it was it tortured him, and he was only eight years old, and the Lubavitch Rebbe gave him love, care, and hope, and clarity, and the Lubavitch Rebbe didn't just do that for my dad, he did that for, you know, the whole world, he did that for so many people, he did that for me, he continues to do that for me. And the Rebbe stopped uh, saying the Sicha, and he said such harrowing words. And I don't, I'm not going to say exactly word for word. I was going to read it from the paper, but I decided to just say it in my own words. He said, everything I've done is for Hevel, is Hevel Valeric, is for not, is for none. Nothing that I, I've done matters because Mashiach is not here yet. And he said, it's the month of Nisan. It's the, the month of the Hebrew month of Nisan. It's the month of redemption. Mashiach is not here. I, I can't understand it. And then he said something that breaks my heart, but also motivates me and strengthens me and pushes me to overcome my fears. I can't explain how afraid I am of public speaking. I literally haven't slept in about four nights. I don't even know how I'm functioning. I, I can't eat. Like when I eat something, my stomach just feels like it's going to vomit. I do it because of these words. I promise you now I do it 
because I know that the harder it is for me, the more I need to do it because of these words. The Rebbe said, I have done everything I can to bring Mashiach, and now it's up to you. I give it over to you. Can you imagine that? He said, I, I've done everything I can. There's nothing else I can do. And then he said, basically, Mashiach's not here because no one cares. The man didn't leave New York for 40 years, four zero years. He did not leave New York for 40 years. He lived and breathed Jewish people. And Mashiach didn't come. He lived and breathed Mashiach because God swore to the Jewish people that there would be a day where death would be swallowed up forever and the whole world would know that there is one God. He swore to us. We have to keep God account accountable on that, on that promise. And I keep thinking, this is so funny, one of my favorite movies of all time, top five, besides Pride and Prejudice and Last of the Mohicans, my, probably my most favorite movie of all time is Black Hawk Down, and not just because Josh Hartnett is the most perfect man that ever lived. Black Hawk Down, there's this, um, besides my eventual husband, who I don't know who he is yet, but um, uh, there's this scene that I'm going to talk about before in, to introduce my father, there's a scene where everyone is, at, it's in Somalia, right? I hope I'm not getting the country wrong. Um, no one was prepared for this little war, that, I mean this, this, this war which ended up killing so many people. They thought, they didn't even bring water. You guys probably watched the movie. It's so famous, it's the best movie. It's my favorite movie. I've watched it maybe 18, 20 times. I just watch it when I, whenever like, I need something to watch. And so, they don't bring water, they don't bring anything, they're totally not unprepared because they think it's gonna be like the most simple, um, you know, they, they drop in, they, they take the, the criminals and they get out of there. And they end up staying there the entire day. So many people are injured, so many people are hurt, and three, I believe it's three Blackhawks are shot down. And so everyone's getting the hell out of the city. And there's this one scene, this pilot with very light blue eyes, if you guys have watched the movie, and he's, I think, the third Black Hawk, and he's trying to get back to base. And he's shot down, and he's swirling and swirling and swirling and swirling, and he drops straight down on the floor. And I think the rest, all the other pilots who were with him, all the other people in the in the Black Hawk, they all die. And he's there alone, and he calls he calls the general, whoever it is. He says, "Where the hell is is the is is the um, the rescue team? Where is someone someone has to come and find me? I'm stuck here alone." He basically knows that if someone doesn't come and find him, he's gonna die because he's in the middle of he's in the heart of the city. Is it Mogadishu? I think it's Mogadishu. I don't remember exactly. He's in the heart of the city, and he's gonna die. And so the general or whoever the chief something I don't know military terms. He says, "There's he said you have to wait, you have to hold out because there's no one to come and get you." He said, there's no one to come and get you. Everyone is leaving. There are so many wounded. There are so many dead. We can't send any rescue mission to get you. And the two soldiers who were next to that general say, we're going. And the general says, you are absolutely not going. And the two soldiers say, no, we're going to get him. We're not leaving him behind. And this makes me cry every time. And so the general says, you understand that accepting this mission means you're probably not going to come home alive. This is a suicide mission. And the two soldiers say, we'd rather die than leave our man behind. And so there's this emotional moment where they're flying and they're dropping down these two, I'm going to cry, <laughs> they're dropping down these two soldiers to, 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 um, to rescue this, this, this pilot who's stuck, literally stuck in this, in this um, Black Hawk. And as they're running, the pilot screams, he's like, where the hell is the rescue mission? Like he sees these two soldiers in the middle of Mogadishu, I think that's the name of the city. He's like, where is the rescue mission? And they silently answer him, we're it. We're it. There's no one else coming. We're it. There's only us two. And um, they end up dying. And he actually, the pilot that, that was uh, shot down, he's actually historically, he was, um, he was uh, captured. And I think they kept him for a few months and they gave him back to the Americans. But um, that moment where he says, he sees fellow soldiers and he's like, his heart is racing and he starts to smile. He's like, but like, where, where's the rescue mission? And they say, we're it. And I can't help but think when the Lubavitcher Rebbe was sitting there and my father tell, told me the story. He was in London at, the, at that point. I, well, Oxford, I was born in London. My parents were in Schluchus in, um, in Oxford, meaning the Rebbe sent them on like a uh, Jew, Jewish outreach work. So they moved to Oxford for 11 years. And my father would, there was this like phone hookup and you can call and listen in to what the Lubavitcher Rebbe was saying in New York. And my father said that he was just sitting still. He felt like a stone. You can't describe it. There's no, there's no words to describe how the Hasidim, how the Chabadniks, 
how the world felt when the Rebbe said that basically no one cares. Mashiach, everything I've done. The Rebbe said everything I've done is for Laheva Valerik. It's all like it never happened because Mashiach is not here yet. And so I remember two years ago, Pesach, we were in Mexico. I got really, really drunk at the Mashiach Surah. At the end of Pesach, for those of you who don't know, there's um, this uh, festive like meal called the Mashiach Suda, the like the redemption meal, and you have four glaps, um, glaps, cups of wine, glasses of wine, and you sing nigunim, which are like holy melodies, and you talk about Mash the coming of Mashiach and blah blah blah. And I had like six or seven cups of wine, and I started screaming and crying, and I humiliated myself, and I got up in front of maybe 400 people, and I started yelling like, "Where is Mashiach? No one cares. No one cares." were like gullus we're going to be in exile forever and i started screaming and crying like throwing things they had to like hold me down i went freaking insane i woke up the next morning like i've ruined myself i'm a ruined woman but um i remember waking up the next morning and thinking about well i didn't think about black hawk down then but i'm thinking about it now i look in the mirror and i I'm constantly thinking like who's coming to save us? Like who's gonna take us out of exile? Who's gonna take who's gonna build the base of Mikdash? Who's gonna stop my, my my girlfriends from making bad decisions with men? Who's gonna stop uh that that son from destroying his relationship with his father? And I look at myself in the mirror and I say, You're it. There's no one coming to save you. You're the rescue team. You're the rescue there's no one else coming. There's no one else freaking coming. When the Rebbe said that I've done everything I can and I'm putting it in your hands, I'm pretty sure those are the exact words. He said, I'm putting it in your hands. It's up to you. What was he really saying? We're not going to cry over this. What did he say? What, was, what did the Rebbe say when he said, I've done everything I can. It's now up to you. He said, you have to become your own leader. You can't, you can't rely on me anymore. It's over. You have to be your own rescue team. You must be your own guiding light. And I'm accepting this now, and this is why I want, I'm want. i excited to do this Thirsty Souls event called the Quench event, because I'm it. You're it. No one's going to come and save you from yourself. No one's coming to save the Jewish people. It's us. We, the Jewish people, have to save ourselves. And I'm not saying God isn't here to help, but I'm not saying that mentors aren't here to, to guide us spiritually, physically, emotionally, mentally. I'm not saying there's no help. I'm saying, where's the rescue team? Dude. You're it. There's no one coming to save you. If I see my, my friends making bad decisions with men, I can't just say they're going to figure it out. I have to help them. I'm the freaking rescue mission. I'm the rescue team. I, if I want to scream and cry and throw things at the wall and say, where the hell is Mashiach? God doesn't care. I'm it. I'm it. There's no, I'm it. I'm the rescue team. So are you. And that's why I want these kids to come and hear my father because my father has a, the way, a way with words. By the way, do you guys think that Moshe, everybody know that Moses really couldn't speak? He had a, a, a stutter so he couldn't talk? No, Moshe couldn't talk because he couldn't articulate the anguish that he was going through because of what the Jewish people were going through. They were in a state of such deep denial. They were in a slavery state and they basically said, it's fine because we're comfortable. We have food on our, our tables. And later on they say that, I believe in, Gen in non Genesis and Exodus, they say, at least we had bread in, in Mitzrayim in Egypt. Moshe couldn't talk because he couldn't articulate the, the pain of the Jewish people. And my father knows how to articulate things. And I want these young men and women to come and, um, and become their own leaders. We need to start becoming our own leaders. We can't, we have to hold God accountable uh, for that promise that Mashiach is going to come. And we're going to do everything we can to the Lubavitch Rebbe. And I know that he's always listening to me. I'm ta I talk to him all the time, call me crazy. But um, he knows that we're not going to stop till Mashiach comes because it's, uh, it's just the truth. If there's one thing that my father and the Lubavitch Rebbe taught me, it's that truth will never change. It never started and truth never began and it never ends. It just truth is truth it just always is it was it is it was it always will be it, it never began it never it never ends and Mashiach is true the state of the world right now is not true it's not completely true so anyways uh, to those of you who are in, in the ages the age range of 20 to 30 please come uh, the flyers on the Thirsty Souls Facebook page Mashiach now Rab, but we won't let you down everyone do something you have to do something yourself it is in your hands do something to bring Mashiach um, the days of the Messiah when uh, the whole world will know that Hashem Echad and uh, men will beat their swords into plowshares and the wolf shall lie with the lamb 
and we will all be we will be able to talk to the six million who were stolen from us and we'll be like dude it's been so long 70 years without you guys it's so painful let's not even talk about it Mashiach's here and we're living together in Israel I can't wait to meet our six million because it's too painful a subject to even think about so it takes me down a very dark road I don't like going there so I don't I've chosen not to um, yeah so I know today is Yom HaShoah and I'm sorry if I, I if I, it seems like I'm not commemorating it I promise you I am in my own personal way it's just too uh, painful to talk about I don't have the words I'm kind of like Moshe I'm, I'm bereft of words I, I I'm uncircumcised lips I don't know how to talk about the Holocaust it's something I don't uh, I don't have a language for it so I'm sorry about that so I'll see you guys tonight. Stay thirsty.